So I'm standing at the base of Wantastiget Mountain across the Connecticut River from Brattleboro. This is a site that has a pretty steep southwesterly facing exposure. And because of that, a pretty hot, dry site. In fact, the forest here is almost more representative of a forest down in Pennsylvania. As you get up about in the middle slope of the mountain, you're into a forest dominated by white oak and shagbark hickory with some flowering dogwood and, and species like that, which are pretty uncommon up here. In any case, this site, because of its hot, dry nature, has been a site that's been visited by a wildfire a number of times. The biggest one being back in the 1940s that burned off this whole side of the mountain, consuming a couple thousand acres of forest land. Evidence of that fire is what I call an age discontinuity, which can be seen on this site. So we have some trees, a very large stature here, like these white pines to my left. And then everything else is of much smaller stature. Maybe the biggest thing I'm seeing here that's of smaller stature might be getting up to a foot in diameter. But everything in between, basically three feet in diameter and one foot in diameter is missing. And that's a clear sign of fire. When you have an age discontinuity like that, and your larger trees like these pines are up about 150 years of age, fire is the only thing that can create a structure in a forest like that. So this is a good example of that. As the camera pans around, you'll be able to see a lot of bigger trees and then trees of moderate to small size, and then everything in between those two size classes missing. Along with a, an age discontinuity, other very good evidence of fire are multiple trunk trees where the original trunk was quite small in diameter. So here's a double trunked red maple. And when this tree was growing as a, as a double trunked maple, there were more branches on this side of this trunk, more branches on this side of this trunk. So this trunk put on more wood out on this side. This trunk put out more wood on that side. So the centers of these trees are not right in the middle of the trunk. They're in about here and here. So if we come down, the original tree was probably only about three inches in diameter. And we're right here in a, in a state reservation that hasn't been logged or anything. But even in a site that gets logged, if I found a lot of trees that are only three, four inches in diameter that were cut, that's a very odd thing to do. Even people going after cordwood usually don't cut trees that small. So multiple trunk trees whose original trees were very small in diameter is a good sign of fire, that heat killed the tree, making it stump sprout. If we get multiple trunk trees where the original trunk was more like two feet in diameter, 30 inches in diameter, that's really good evidence of logging because usually trees at that size around here are really hard to kill with the heat of a fire. They'll often get basal fire scars, which we'll see in a bit, but they usually are not outright killed. So again, small diameter trees that get heat killed by a fire will stump sprout, and that's good evidence of fire. A third really good piece of evidence for fire are what I call uphill basal fire scars, like this, this basal scar on this black birch here. On a slope, fire burns uphill, but also on a slope, gravity is constantly pulling forest debris and litter downhill. And every tree trunk is acting like a dam to that flow. So on the uphill side of a tree, you start to develop piles of forest litter and debris. Let's say if a tree falls down, its trunk may roll down slope and lodge against the uphill side of another standing tree, but leaves pile up, sticks pile up and you get what's called a fuel pocket. And so as the fire is burning up a slope, it will race by the bottom of the downhill side of the tree where there's not much fuel, but then it hits that fuel pocket and it burns there longer, basically killing the cambial tissues under the bark. The way this works, the fire doesn't burn through the bark. When this tree originally was, was hit by this fire, it would have had, right after the fire is done, it would have had you know, singed and charcoal covered bark on its outside. But the tissue underneath the bark would have been dead. And then some years later, the bark would have sloughed off to expose the now unprotected wood. And then decay gets in there and start to get the, the basal scar to be even deeper. Here's another uphill basal fire scar. This one on a shag bark hickory, which tends to be a fire adapted tree. The reason it has the shags are to get many layers of bark to protect from the heat of a fire. 
this area here burned about 10 years ago. The fire consumed about 30 acres. And there's a lot of downed trees that were heat killed by the fire. Most of the stuff I'm seeing down were the red maples that have thin bark and got heat killed. The remaining trees that are standing are pretty much red oaks, which have thicker bark and did a better job. This maple didn't get heat killed outright. It did have a nice, good size basal fire scar here, going up to probably almost 10 feet in height. The tree was still alive. That's seen by the callus wood that started trying to heal over that wound. But the exposed fire scar allowed rot to get and weaken the trunk. And now the trunk is snapping off. And the tree, sensing that it might not have long to live, sent up a number of stump sprouts. So here we can see these stump sprouts coming up, but no one cut this tree. This tree was damaged by fire. There are a few species of tree that will naturally stump sprout around their trunks without having any damage to the trunk. So basswood will do that. Gray birch will do that. But red maple will not do that. So this is an example, again, of evidence of fire a tree with uphill basal fire scar, severely damaged, and then its stump sprouts in response. Many people think that charcoal is really good evidence of fire, at least good visible evidence. And actually in our, in our New England forest, it's not that great evidence. You'll only find it on already dead wood on the ground, wood that's already down and dead, or in basal scars from previous fires. Because the only stuff that's going to charcoalize is exposed wood. So in our trees that have bark on them, the fire doesn't burn through the bark. It singes it, and then the bark falls off where the fire scar is. Now, I came over to this tree to see if we could find a charcoal in this, this more recent fire. And uh, because this is a pretty old fire scar by the amount of wood that's grown out around the fire scar. But in this case, I can't find a charcoal. This tree has an incredible amount of probably ant activity in it and a lot of sawdust. So I don't know if the fire actually got in there to burn the wood. But if you can find trees that have been fire scarred previously and then another fire comes along subsequently, you'll find charcoal in those basal fire scars. And one way to test it is charcoal, if you rub it, it's going to blacken your fingers. Now, we do have something around here called charcoal mat fungus which grows on decaying wood like maple, beech, trees like that. In late stages of decay, those trees can get carpeted in this stuff. And people see these black and, let's say, stumps from trees that have been logged and think, oh, there's a fire here. But if you go and rub that charcoal mat fungus, it won't blacken your fingers at all, whereas charcoal will. And charcoal also has that blocky pattern where charcoal mat fungus is smooth. Here's one of these red maple that was heat killed by this fire. Here's a stump sprout. And now this tree already was compromised before the fire, but the fire certainly killed it. And this is charcoal mat fungus in here. I can rub this stuff. It's not darkening my fingers at all. It's not broken up in a blocky pattern. Very common in late stages of decay, particularly on maples and beech. Generally, if you get logging that cut out, let's say, sugar maple and beech, their stumps after about 20 years just become completely blackened. Or if you look at roadside, let's say, sugar maples that have been hit by a car and you're getting a basal scar in those trees, take a look, you'll see the black in there. And again, that's from the charcoal mat fungus, which is just part of the late stages of decay of these species. Here's an interesting stump. This is one of our conifers, and it's actually a white pine. And one way you can distinguish white pine from hemlock is that white pine puts down a tier of limbs every year. It's called a limb whirl. So they have these tiers that are stacked up. So on a stump like this, you start seeing three or more limbs growing out of the same height in the stump. That tells you it's white pine. So here's one right there. There's another one there, another one there, a little one here, another one here, all coming out of this point right here. Hemlock won't do that. Their limbs are more indiscriminate in where they grow, but this is classic white pine. And for a white pine stump to get to this state of decay, you're looking at probably close to 50 years because we're pretty much down just to the limb whirl. There's not much left there. And of course, 
the the rate of decay is variable based on the size of the original tree. Bigger trees take longer to decay, and also based on the site conditions. If you're on a very dry site, decay is going to be slower than on a more moist site. But I'd say, yeah, we had a white pine that was cut here probably a good 50 years ago, and I think I'm probably within about 10 years of when that, that logging occurred. One other thing I'll mention, if you find stumps like this, even if they don't have the flat top and there's no downed log near them, that's very good evidence of logging. We can get stumps that are produced by deadfall where trees snap off down near ground level and fall down on the ground, but usually if you have a stump, you're going to have the tree the down trunk of the tree with it. If it's missing, it's pretty good evidence of logging. Right to my right here, we have a coppiced or multiple trunked red maple. There's a number of them in this section of the forest. When trees do this, it's usually because they've either been cut in a logging event or they may have been heat killed by a fire. And then the zone below where the cut was made or where the fire girdled the tree adventitious buds are activated and they sprout up new growth. And so what you get is a tree that has, in this case, right now, one, two, three, four trunks growing out of it, but there's two that also were here that have since died because they probably just didn't get enough light. So to try to separate out fire from logging, you want to try to estimate the size of the original tree. Around here, if fires are going to truly heat kill a tree, they're going to be pretty small, you know, in the realm of a few inches. So looking at the ones around us here, like for example, this trunk to this trunk, these would have come up on the outside of the stump. So the original trunk would have been probably something like that, maybe about 16 inches in diameter. And that's generally a little bit large to be heat killed by a fire around here. So what this is telling us is that we had a logging event here and looking at the number of stems, size of stems, you know, I'm guessing that that logging happened maybe 40 or 50 years ago. I'm standing on a pretty classic crop field wall. Above us is an area that the ground's pretty smooth and even, but there's a lot of rocks in here, which is a little bit unusual for a crop field with big boulders. But definitely this side down here, the ground very pillowed and cradled. And also, you let that double trunked red maple back there. It's going just up against the right hand side of the wall. If you look at the left trunk, you'll see a lot of old dead limbs stretching out into what was this crop field. But if you look at the other side of the right-hand trunk, you'll see it's really smooth. There's not any presence of big limbs or even knobs where limbs might have been and died, rotted away, and got, got, got grown over. So uh, obviously, the pasture side abandoned before the crop field side. My, my guess is that at a time of abandonment, this was no longer a crop field. It was probably a hay field abandoned after the original pasture was abandoned. I'm standing in front of a pasture tree and pasture trees have two attributes. The first is they're open grown, which means they grew all by themselves in full sunlight. And because of that, they grow and spread out very large low limbs. We got Two limbs on this side, there's a rounded knob right up there. That would have been where another limb was that has since broken off and healed over. A bunch more of these knobs behind the tree. So these pasture trees growing out in the open sense the light all around them and really stretch out to take advantage of it. The second attribute is that it's not in a fence line. This is not growing out of or next to a stone fence. It doesn't have any wire fencing on it. In fact, about 40 feet behind it, there is a stone fence that runs in that direction. So whenever I see a tree like this out in what was once an open agricultural landscape, I'm thinking I'm not in a crop field where a tree like this would make plowing and tending crops a problem. I'm probably not in a hay field where the shade produced by a healthy tree like this would reduce the growth of hay underneath it, but most likely in a pasture where these trees would have been left to offer shade for livestock in the summertime. And if you look around, the corroborating evidence we're in a pasture is that it's very, very rocky and there's pillows and cradles, meaning it's never been plowed. So surely a pasture with a pasture tree in it, a very sort of classic thing. And it's sad, this tree, this sugar maple is dead. It has no life left in it. And about a hundred years from now, these open grown trees in our woodlands are gonna be very, very rare. And at some point they're gonna disappear, which is really sad because they're an important heritage of the land. They're critical 
for wildlife. One of my grad students, Michael Gage, did a comparative study between open grown trees like this pasture tree and neighboring trees about 50 meters away of the same species that were about 80 years of age and forest grown. And his studies conclusively showed that wildlife frequented these open grown big trees way, way, way more frequently than the forest grown trees. And that's true for birds as well as mammals. So they offer a lot and it's gonna be sad because we eventually will lose them. We are now in an abandoned, overgrazed pasture. And with good pasture management, productive pastures can be maintained for long, long periods of time. And that involves intensive grazing and then frequent rotation of livestock. But if livestock are left in one pastured site and aren't rotated, they're gonna start altering the pasture and allowing vegetation to move in that is not great for pastured livestock. So what happens is the overgrazing commences with the thinning of the, the grasses. That allows basal rosettes to move in, plants that have their leaves growing at ground level in a radial fashion. They're followed by upward growing herbaceous plants that are usually unpalatable or maybe armed with spines like thistle. And then those upward growing herbaceous plants can act as nurseries for the invasion of shrubs, berry producing shrubs. And one of the shrubs that comes in that, that third phase is common juniper. And that's what we have here. This is the skeletal remains of common juniper. And there's just all these clumps all over the place. Whenever you find robust populations of common juniper, either alive or dead in this case, there's only one of four sites you're gonna find them in. They grow robustly like this. So one site, are rock outcroppings, so they're growing up in the crevices of those outcrop situations. A second site you'll see them is in mats of moss on very dry, sandy soils. A third site would be power line cuts that are treated with herbicides. And the fourth site are overgrazed pastures. And the reason these are the only four sites you're gonna find a lot of juniper is that juniper is very slow growing in its first five to 10 years of growth and is also intolerant of being shaded. So it has to establish in sites where herbaceous plants aren't going to grow up and over it and shade it and kill it. So that's not going to happen in the crevice of a rock outcropping. That's not going to happen in a moss mat that has very little herbaceous growth. It's not going to happen in a power line cut where herbicides are used to kill off that herbaceous vegetation. And it's not going to happen in an overgrazed pasture where livestock will crop around every unpalatable juniper, giving them the chance to establish. Now, juniper is shade intolerant. So once abandonment takes place and the canopy starts forming over it, they're gonna die. But luckily, juniper has very resinous, rot-resistant wood. So dead skeletal remains can exist for 50, 60 years or more after they've died. This area here, I remember when this was active pasture, this was abandoned about 40, 45 years ago. And I'm guessing these junipers probably died within the last maybe 30 years. And they'll still be here another probably 30 years from now, but 40 or 50 years from now, they'll be gone. And that evidence will be gone with them. But luckily, we'll have other features that still will let us know we had pasture land here. I'm standing on the edge of a hayfield. You'll see it over here uh, off this direction. And this lower section, the lower like maybe 30 feet has not been mowed in a few years. Matter of fact, I can age these pines. So like there's one, two, three, four. So probably about six years ago, they stopped mowing this lower section. But before this was a hay field, this was a crop field. And the evidence of that is this structure right here, which is called a bottom plow terrace. I'm standing right on the edge of it. But if you look at the topography, from that hay field, the slope is coming down and then it sort of levels out right here for about five feet or so and then abruptly drops off again. This little terrace of about five feet is from many plowings that push soil downhill. And when the plowing stopped, that soil just piled up to make this terrace. Hay fields were generally plowed just a few times to prepare them for uh, sowing seed. So to get this much soil here means it had to be plowed year after year for a number of years. So originally this would have been a, a crop field, most likely for growing grains. A lot of grains were grown around here in the late uh, 1700s into about the middle of the 
1800s. And then when rail starts bringing grain into the region, grown further out west, then we're moving into dairy farming. Dairy farmers start converting their crop fields into hay fields or pastures. Is growing large acreages of crops was the most sort of labor intensive work. So with the proceeds of the dairy money, they could just buy the grain now, which meant a lot of crop fields were converted around the time of the Civil War into just hay fields or pastures. But again, the telling feature here is this, this bottom plow terrace. And then off this way, all the rocks that came out of this thing, and there's big rocks down here, but uh, on the way up, we crossed piles of small rocks. All of that rock was dumped. And since no wall was constructed here, that means that this area down below was never open for agricultural activity. It would have been a woodlot. No reason to build a stone fence to keep uh, animals out of this crop field because there weren't any animals down there. A lot of things that we've looked at as years go by are going to start disappearing from our forest. These, you know, open grown trees. Things like common juniper that came into overgrazed pastures. Even in some amount of time, even the stone walls will start to disappear, but that probably won't be for many, many, many centuries yet. But there will always be new disturbances that are moving in. There's always going to be the impact of wind. There'll be, as long as people around here, some impact from fire. There's certainly going to be logging. There may be areas that get reopened up for agricultural land and then abandoned again. That's certainly a possibility. So this evidence will still continue to crop up based on the various disturbance histories that will visit this region. And people in the future will be able to tell if they want to interpret their forest histories just as we can today. I should mention, we are moving into what I call an evolutionary bottleneck, or ecologists call an evolutionary bottleneck, is one of the things that's gonna be present in our future forests is we have three or four things coming into play that are gonna really start to diminish the diversity of our forest in a period of centuries. That is impact of aggressive invasive plants, the impact of exotic pathogens that are affecting our trees, climate change, and I think also greater development pressures. Because I think with climate change, what we're going to see is there's been a pretty much a movement of people moving from north and east to south and west. And I think we're going to see that flow reversing because I think some parts of the deep south and out west, as climate change continues, are going to become very difficult places to live. And I think there's going to be a lot of influx of people coming back up to the north and the east. However, this is a bottleneck. These things are all going to play out over a period of centuries. But I think, you know, a, a good amount of time from now, maybe a thousand years from now, a lot of these things are going to be worked out. The aggressive invasives will actually start co-evolving and becoming participants, regular participants in our regional ecosystems. The trees will develop. <laughs> the trees will develop basically, you know, immunities to pathogens. So I think, you know, in a period of a thousand or more years, our forests are going to be fine, but we're going to have to sort of shepherd them through this bottleneck over the upcoming centuries.